Good morning, detectives. Welcome, 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 everyone. How are we all going today, guys? How have we been? How was the rest of your morning? How was the rest of your afternoon yesterday? Hope we are all feeling pumped, excited, ready to go. So as I mentioned to you guys yesterday, today we are moving on to some new topics. Some really, really, really exciting stuff. Two things that we're going to be covering today. Two things. First up, we are going to look at some writing. More specifically, guys, we are going to be looking at creative writing. And trust me, it is going to be so, so, so fun. Like, who doesn't love creative writing? Creative writing lets your imagination run loose. It's so, so, so fun. And we are going to absolutely have the best time of our lives today. And then after that, we're not going to stop there. We're not going to stop the fun there. We are going to put our detective hats back on and look at some evaluation questions so with that being said who is hashtag ready let me make this a bit thicker who is hashtag ready hashtag ready to get into today's english and writing work let's do this guys let's get into it who is feeling hashtag ready i want detective hats on detective hats on so we can get into it today let's Go. Let's do it. Okay. So I've got a little think and share question to start us off, guys. Let's say that you discover a time machine. I want you to tell me what would you do with this time machine. And I want you to give me three justifications for your pick. What would you do and why would you do it? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay? Are we ready? In three, two, one. Let's go. right detectives i'm seeing lots of crazy answers in the comments everyone has a really really good imagination in this class clearly who has a good imagination comment down below for me do you think you have a good imagination yes or no the reality is guys for a question like this what would you with a time machine well the possibilities are truly endless maybe you want to go back in time and meet one of your family members that has passed away Maybe you want to go back in time and bring in, uh, I don't know, something from the future, something from today, back into the past. Maybe you want to bring an iPhone to the 1600s. Maybe you want to go back to the dinosaurs. Maybe you want to travel to the future and see what happens and prepare for it. Come back to your present life, prepare for it today. Maybe you wouldn't use it at all. Maybe you wouldn't use it at all and you would just, boom, be like, okay, I've got to keep this locked up because this is dangerous. So many different possibilities. Maybe you'd go back and invest in like some sort of uh, stock or cryptocurrency and use that money for your future. So many different possibilities, guys, here. Pretty much anything that you want to do, you could. But the key thing is, time machines are pretty common in novels, right? They're pretty common in movies. They're pretty common in everything. What you need to do is make your writing unique. Make your writing unique 
make your writing something different from everyone else's, okay? So, everyone has a time machine story that they've heard of a bit before. Everyone's heard of a time machine story. What you can do now is make your story stand out, okay? Let's do this. So, what is creative writing? Just a little bit of a recap. Creative writing, guys, is a form of fictional writing in which the author creates events, scenes, characters, and sometimes even a world out of their imagination. Pretty much any type of writing that uses, right, creative writing, any type of writing that uses your imagination. Using your imagination. Extremely important here, guys. That's what makes it different to all other types of writing. It uses your imagination. Maybe you've got some crazy character, like, I don't know, a talking half man, half dragon. Or maybe you have a really crazy, well, maybe it's set in like a candy land. I don't know. It could be absolutely anything. As long as it's imaginative, it's unique. You add your own twist, your own spin to whatever you're saying. So, the content is more on personal experiences, emotions, and feelings. So it's pretty self-expressive, okay? You might think to yourself, oh, well, okay, um, it's not really self-expressive because it's not real. It's not actually my real life. In real life, I am not half man, half dinosaur, or half a dragon, or whatever I said before. So how can I possibly have this be self-expressive? Well, the point is, even though it's fictional, even though there are some parts that aren't real, there are still feelings, emotions, experiences involved in the writing process which means you can make it self-expressive. How is it self-expressive? Because you take a, a common thing, like a common theme or a common type of character, a common setting, and again, as I said, you add your own twist to it, guys. You take it and you make it unique to your story. I want your creative writing to be so creative to make it something that no one else has ever seen before. Even if it's a basic story, the way that you write it has to be engaging, has to use emotions, has to use lots of adjectives, lots of imagery to make it stand out, okay? So, what are the different types of creative writing? Can anyone give me a couple of guesses? What are some types of creative writing? What are some types of creative writing? Writing, detectives, what do we think? What are some types of creative writing? Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. I want to see everyone's ideas down below in the comments. And then I'll tell you what all of them actually are. Okay? So, here are the types that we're going to be looking at. Epics, novels, poems, screenplays, and short stories. Five types. Let's have a look at every single type. Who is hashtag ready to look at the five types of creative writing? The reason we're looking at these five types, guys, is because we can actually take different tips and hints on how to write from every single type. So, detective hats on, guys. We're going to need to be detectives for this. We're going to have to look at each type of writing and actually look at it closely, closely, closely and see what we can learn from it, what we can take away to apply to our own writing. Let's do it. Epics. First type is epics. Everyone write this down. We are going to be starting off with epics. These are very, very, very long. Typically book length narratives. Retelling a single person's or a group of people's heroic journey. So epics are very long stories about a heroic journey. Okay? Very long stories about a heroic journey. So, for example, Treasure Island is a very, very common example here. Another one might be the Odyssey. Who has heard of the Odyssey? It's a very, very common example of an epic. A really, really long hero's journey. That is what we're looking for here. So, let's read an excerpt here from Treasure Island. What can we learn from it? He was a very silent man by custom. All day he hung round the cove, or upon the cliffs with a brass telescope. All evening he sat in a corner of the parlour, next to the fire, and drank rum and water very strong. Mostly 
He would not speak when spoken to, only look up sudden and fierce and blow through his nose like a fog, like a foghorn. And we and the people who came about our house soon learned to let him be. What's done really, really well here? What is really good about this piece of writing? What do I learn from this piece of writing? That I'm like, whoa, wait, this is actually really cool. What do I learn from it? Well, here's what I'm thinking when I see this. I'm thinking to myself, this is quite mysterious, isn't it? Why is this man so silent? Why does he not talk to anyone? Why does he just live in his own world? This guy, it seems to me, just by even reading this little part, is really just in his own world, okay? He doesn't care what everyone else is doing. It doesn't matter to him. It doesn't make a difference to him what everyone else is doing. Instead, he just seems to be very much removed from reality. He seems to only be concerned with himself. Why? Well, we don't know why. And that's what's actually done really, really well here. Sometimes it can be better to actually just omit information rather than mention it because it makes it super mysterious like just by reading this i'm like whoa why is this guy like this i want to actually try to understand why is he like this that's exactly the point that's what the author's trying to do here by making it so mysterious i want to read more after i've read this i want to actually understand what is happening and why were these people so e they're so eager to accept this guy as never talking to them. He, he lives in this house, right? He came about their house, but they still don't really talk to him at all. Have they made an effort? Has he made an effort? What is this guy's deal? No one knows. So what can you do? What can we learn from this to apply to our own writing? Learn to be mysterious sometimes. Make the reader want to keep reading, okay? Another thing that's really, really done well here is the description, the physical description of this guy, okay? What we can do to make our descriptions really enticing is we can use the five senses. I want everyone in the comments right now, what are the five senses? In the comments, guys, what are the five senses? Let's write them down. Uh, one is sight or vision. Next up, number two is hearing. Number three is taste. Number four is touch. And number five is smell. So what can we do, guys? We can use different types of imagery or related to the five senses to actually make really, really good descriptions. That is what I have learned from this excerpt. Okay? They don't just say, oh, this guy was quiet. That's boring. Look at this. He was a very silent man by custom. All day he did this, all evening he did this. Very detailed, interesting description. I don't get bored from reading this. I'm like, oh, this is oddly specific. Why is this guy doing this? I want to find out more. That is the difference here. Okay, guys, lots that we can learn from this style of writing. Let's keep going. A novel now. This is probably the most common type that you guys have encountered. I'm assuming a lot of you like reading novels. Comment down below for me who reads every single night. Every single night. Who reads even a little bit every single night. It's honestly, guys, one of the best habits you can do. Reading can help you with your writing and with your actual English questions too. And novels are a really good way to get into them. So... A novel is a long work of fiction, usually having a plot and characters. The difference is that an epic is only about this heroic journey, okay? But a novel can be about anything. Like, for example, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And it wasn't simply an ordinary, enormous chocolate factory either. It was the largest and most famous in the whole world. It was Wonka's factory, owned by a man named Willy Wonka, the greatest inventor and maker of chocolates that there has ever been. And what a tremendous, marvelous place it was. It had a huge iron gate leading into it and a high wall surrounding it. So guys, 
what is the, something that you can pick up from this? What is something that we pick up from this novel? Oh, not from this novel, sorry. From this excerpt from the novel. Hyperbole. Hyperbole. I can see a lot of hyperbole in this description. What is a hyperbole? Who can give me an, a definition in the comments? What is hyperbole? An answer. What is hyperbole, guys? Comment down below for me. A hyperbole is an over... What is it? Comment, 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 comment. Over exaggeration. Okay. Hyperbole is just a fancy word for over exaggeration. So, not just an ordinary enormous chocolate factory. The largest, the most famous. That is a hyperbole. Also, guys, we have here what is called an oxymoron, okay? Sounds like a really funny word, but let me explain what this means. Okay, here's the oxymoron. It wasn't an ordinary, enormous chocolate factory either. That is an oxymoron. An oxymoron is when we have two words next to each other that contradict. Two words next to each other that don't usually go together. For example, the deafening silence. Well, how can silence be deafening? An ordinary enormous chocolate factory. How can something that's ordinary be enormous? Crazy, right? So this technique is known as an oxymoron. You can use these in your writing to get the reader thinking. When a reader says this, they're like, wait a second, how, how does this work? What? How? They're trying to make that connection in their head. That's exactly what you want to do. Make the reader think about your work. Make the reader constantly ponder about what you've written. Make sense here, guys? Perfect, perfect, perfect. That's a novel. Let's keep going. A poem. A piece of writing in which words are carefully chosen for their beauty and sound. It is typically written in short, rhymed lines. Poems, guys. We've all seen poems before, of course. If this is like my A4 piece of paper, a narrative piece might look like this. It has like long lines, full sentences, there's a paragraph, then I've got a bit of a break, and then a next, another paragraph, lots of long lines together. That would be a narrative. But if I go over here now to a poem, a poem might look like this. It would have like a little stanza, short lines, break. Little stanza, short lines, break. Little stanza, short lines again, and break. So these are not called paragraphs in a poem. They are called stanzas. Each chunk of text is called a stanza. Okay? So for example, let's read this poem about Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. When little Snow White's mother died, uh, the king, her father, up and cried, Oh, what a nuisance, what a life! Now I must find another wife. He wrote to every magazine and said, I'm looking for a queen. At least 10,000 girls replied and begged to be the royal bride. The king said with a shifty smile. Da, 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 da. So, one really cool thing about poems is that sometimes they rhyme. Okay? Die and cried. Life and wife. Magazine and queen. Replied and bride. And so on and so forth. There is rhyme. Now, not every poem has rhyme, but quite a few do. Quite a lot of poems do include rhyme. What else is unique about poetry? The structure of the poem is quite different. As you can see, I have a whole sentence here running over multiple lines. Pretty unique, right? Very, very interesting poem. And the fact that he's begging for another wife, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I want to keep reading. Because the poem is called Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, but the Seven Dwarves haven't even come up until this point. Snow White has only been mentioned once. So I still want to keep reading. Here I've got a cliffhanger. The cliffhanger in this poem makes me want to keep reading. A screenplay is a written material that serves as the foundation for a film or a play. right? So this is basically just the script for a film. Now You guys will probably not be writing many of these but they can still be good to know about so the difference here is they actually say the name of whoever speaks so that the actor can actually read it more easily 
And they have stage directions to tell you how to act if you are right acting out this role. So when Miss Little says this, she must be very, very, very excited. Okay. The stage direction tells them how to act. Pretty interesting. And the last one is a, is a short story. A story that is fully developed thematically, but is much shorter and simpler than a novel. This, guys, is the closest to what you will be writing when you do creative writing. Okay? You guys will probably be writing more short stories. Why? Because a novel, like who can who can guess? Who can guess? How long is a novel? How many words? In a novel. How many words in a novel do you guys think? How many words? Don't Google it. I want you guys to guess because I'm going to Google it right now. How many words in a novel? Who can guess? How many words? What do you guys think? How many words? I'll give you the answer. Right? The average word count for like young adult fiction, which is what you guys might be reading a little bit. For young adults, 50,000 to 70,000 words for a young adult novel. For an adult novel, 70,000 to 120,000 words. So, these are very, very, very long, right? Like, I'm seeing everyone's guesses in the comments, or at least most people's, are nowhere near these numbers. So, therefore, we will not expect you guys to uh, write 50,000 words for homework, <laughs> right? Definitely, that is not what we want you to do. That's why you'll be more on the short story side. So yes, 70 to 120,000 for adult novels, 50,000 to 70,000 for young adult novels. And there are some novels that are even longer than that. Like, what is the longest novel, do we think? Let's Google this. How many words in the longest book? Let's check. The longest book is 3.2 million words. That's right. 3.2 million. <laughs> Very, very, very big. I cannot imagine how long that would take to read. Oh my goodness. So as you guys can tell, they can get pretty big. Which is why we focus more on short stories. Now what's the difference? In a novel, they have plenty of time to introduce all the characters. To introduce everything that happens. In a short story, because you have less words, you have to kind of fit everything into a shorter format. So let's see how this is done in Jack and the Beanstalk. She shouted and threw Jack's beans out of the window. He found the giant's castle and persuaded the giant's wife to feed him. But then he heard heavy footsteps and a loud voice saying, The next morning there was a marvellous beanstalk, as strong as an oak tree, growing right up to the sky. Without a thought, Jack climbed up it and found himself. In another country. Whoa. So what do we learn here? What do we learn from this? Do you guys see what's happened? There is so much action over here. That is just jam packed. If you're writing your own creative writing. You are going to have to fit everything into a shorter word count. Right? Which means. Which means. You have to be very very careful. In creating that drama. That action. Using your imagination in the novel. Okay, guys? Let's actually have a look at this. Let's have a look at how you can do this. What are some characteristics of creative writing that you guys can use? Let's have a think about it. First up, unique content. Correct grammar. Smart vocabulary. Clarity and focus. Using transitional markers. And making the writing inspiring. So let's break this down. Let's look at every single one of these things on its own. Are we ready? Let's look at every single one of these things. Okay? Let's go. First up. Unique content. I want everyone to write this down for me. Unique content. The purpose of creative writing, guys, is obviously to entertain readers. So the content must encourage people to read all the way to the end. I know I've already said this a million, billion, trillion times in today's lesson. Use your imagination, guys. Make your writing 
unique. So, when you're writing, when you're doing a creative writing piece, you want to make it different to anything else that's ever been seen before, okay? Make it something cool. Make it something unique. Something that only you could possibly come up with. That's what I want to see. So, unique content is very, very important. Next up, guys. Let's actually try this. I want you to think of a unique idea right now that popped into your mind. I want you to give me a title for a unique story that you can think of right now. In three, two, one, let's go. Right, I'm seeing some really, really good content in the comments. Good job, guys. I'm seeing everyone's taking my unique content advice. I absolutely love it. Next up, correct grammar. Pretty obvious, okay? I know you guys are going to be like, yeah, Anastasia, we already know this, blah, 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 blah. But people often forget it when they're rushing to do their writing, okay? So, creative writing is a form of self-expression. If you want to convey the message properly, your grammar and your sentence structure has to be correct. Okay, how can we do this? Obviously, something like this. The weather was cold. Not the weather were cold. It doesn't make any sense. The weather was cold. Again, guys, this goes without saying. I think it's pretty obvious, but still important to remember. All right. Next up, I want to see some smart vocabulary from everyone. Really, really smart vocabulary. Everyone write this down for me. Some smart vocabulary. Write it down, write it down, write it down. Now, whoever was here last term will remember we have our weekly vocabulary videos during the term. I actually did quite a bit of them for you guys as well. So, there's a whole list of words that you can use. What you can also do is use a website like Word Hippo. And this isn't sponsored or anything, guys. This is just because I love Word Hippo. Like, honestly, Word Hippo is your BFF. I want you to always remember this. Word Hippo is your best friend. I love Word Hippo. It's completely free. You don't have to pay for anything. And it's so, so, so good to use. What happens on Word Hippo is you put a word in and it gives you thousands of synonyms for that word that you can use instead. Better words that will make your writing more juicy, more spicy. So, using simple and complex vocabulary. Using interesting words is important. Now, of course, don't thesaurus every single word. Then your writing is going to sound absolutely fake and it's going to sound unnatural. So, some simple words are good. But that doesn't mean you forget and you neglect all your vocabulary. Okay? So, word hippo is your best friend. Don't forget it. You can use word hippo for all your vocabulary needs when you're writing. Next up, your writing must have clarity and focus. And this is very important, guys, because when we write, we can often go on tangents. Like, I know for sure I have done this in the past, okay? What I've done is, when I've been doing creative writing, I get so distracted, and I start writing about one thing, then I go on a random tangent, then I run out of time, and my story isn't even completed. Not good. I'm shaking my detective hat. 
So, clarity and focus. You pick a single topic, you focus on that topic. You got to keep reminding yourself. If you've picked a theme, you stick to that theme. Okay? Be consistent. Be clear with where you're going. Clarity and focus. Very, very, very important. Next up, transitional markers. These are words that link all your sentences together that make your writing run smoothly. People often forget to put these words in their writing and then it sounds really robotic. Like, if you don't use words like this, your writing is actually going to sound like it came from a machine, from a robot, and it won't be any good. So, words like before, similarly, since, so, yet, besides, briefly, but, presently, second, hence, however, in addition, in conclusion, conversely, and finally. I want everyone to give me two more examples two more examples of traditional markers of transitional markers sorry in the comments right now i want two examples right now in the comments two examples right now i'll give you one firstly firstly wasn't mentioned here the word and pretty simple right the word and what else do we have? I want to see everyone's answers in the comments, guys. Two more examples from everyone. All my detectives. Two more examples from everyone. Let's see. I'll give you another one. Nevertheless. Although. Meanwhile. In fact. Lastly, there are so many of these that you can use and they actually just help your writing flow. So they're really, 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 really useful in creative writing, guys. Let's keep going. Last thing. Last thing I want you guys to remember when you're writing. It's going to be inspiring. Creative writing serves its purpose. Most of the time, it inspires the audience you learn something from it okay even if your writing is about villains there might be some inspirational character or some source of inspiration even if the character let's say the main character is absolutely evil maybe in the end they turn their life around and you're inspired to be good as well just like the villain has now become good so many different possible sources of inspiration that you can bring up in your writing can be absolutely anything absolutely anything but still bring in some sort of inspiration. Okay, guys? So, here is going to be the homework for today. In 500 words, I want you to choose one of the following images and write a creative writing piece about what might be happening in the image. So you can let your imagination run wild. The three images over here, guys, are actually very, very, very different. So, let me show you. Drum roll, please, everyone, while I pull up the images. Who is ready to have a look? Here's the first one. Here it is. I've got a character here, some guy, who looks like he's going on a hike, right? He's got his camping gear. He looks determined. He's going along. But there's so much you could write to spice this up. Maybe he's on his way to rescue his wife, who's hanging off the edge of a cliff when she slipped when she was hiking. I just made it much more interesting, right? What about this? I've got this crazy world over here with what look like to be dragons. Right? This looks like a dragon. I've got fire on the ground, fire breathing dragons. I've got other things that are dead in the background. The whole world seems to be collapsing in this image. So, lots that you can make up for this image too. And the last one, this is a pretty interesting thing here. It seems like it's set in the future, doesn't it? And wow, look at this crazy world. This world doesn't look anything like our world, does it? Where are they going? I don't know. What are they doing? I don't know. You can tell me if you pick this option. 
Again, guys, as creative as you want, as unique as you can possibly make it. Just choose one of the three images and think to yourself a really, really, really good idea. So, whichever image you like, you can pick one, two, or three. I just want to see 500 words done tonight, okay? Let's do it. Let's use all the skills that we learned today, everything that we spoke about, to write the best creative writing piece on the planet. Okay, guys? Are we all? Hashtag Lagoon Clear with our writing portion of today's lesson. Are we all? Hashtag Lagoon Clear. Are we all clear, guys? Let me see. Are we all clear? Let me see, let me see, let me see the comments. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Well then, guys, that means it is now time for English. And today in English, we are going to be looking at one of my personal favorite topics, which is evaluation. I love evaluation questions. They're really, really, really fun. Let's do it. Let's get into evaluation. Okay. Let me change our scrolling actually so I can scroll vertically. Let's go. Let's say you're boo. You're brave and monsters don't scare you. Not to mention your closet door opens to another crazy world. If given the chance, what kind of world would you want your closet door to lead to? I want some ideas in the comments right now. In three, two, one. Let's go. Right. So I'm seeing lots of crazy worlds in the comments. Clearly your imaginations are still being carried on from writing today. Amazing work, detectives. Massive clap for everyone. Why did I get you guys to do that? Why? Well, first of all, just to continue on our creative writing skills, but also because how do you possibly pick between all these amazing options? Okay, maybe you could have a, a futuristic robotic world like the one at the bottom here. Maybe you could be in a castle in the middle of the forest like this example here how do you choose between these options what you have to do is you have to learn to evaluate what does the word evaluate actually mean what does it mean to evaluate something comment down below for me guys what does it mean to evaluate what does this mean to evaluate means to assess something, to examine it. In other words, to identify key features, positives, negatives, in each option and determine which one matches what you want, which one matches what you are looking for. So to evaluate means to make a judgment. You are making some sort of judgment judgment that is what it means to evaluate to make a judgment okay guys so let's keep this idea in mind when we're looking at some evaluation questions let's actually jump down how to how we can actually evaluate passages when you get these sort of questions guys you're going to get four texts they're going to give you four texts on, a, on the same topic but they're going to take different approaches to that topic so what you can do is look at each text Evaluate separately and then combine them all together. So 
Tip number one, make an outline. Underlining the keywords. I say this literally every type of English text we do because it's so useful. Making an outline. Take a note of anything that's really, really important in the text that stands out. Write it down. Next up, the keywords once again. If you remember the keywords, you can pretty easily figure out which text matches the correct answer option that you're looking for. Find examples and sections that support the main idea. And use some key questions, guys. What? How? Why? Asking yourselves these questions can really, really help you figure out what the point of the text is. What is the author's aim? What's the author's goal? How was this aim achieved? Why did the author aim for that? Those three questions, very, very, very good hints. They help you pick between the texts. Who's ready? I'm going to show you guys four texts right now, and I want you to help me answer the questions that come with them. Who is ready? Let's go. Let's read all the texts. Text A. Let's do it. I want, you guys know what I want. I want keywords in the comments right now. If we're reading, we're going to make sure we're paying attention. We're going to be writing the keywords in the comments. Let's do it. Text A. Cotton is a soft fluffy staple fiber that forms in a bowl or protective casing around the seeds of cotton plants. The fiber is almost entirely composed of cellulose and may contain trace amounts of waxes, lipids, pectins, and water. Under natural conditions, cotton bowls will aid in seed distribution. The shrub is endemic to tropical and subtropical locations throughout the globe. Typically, the fiber is spun into yarn or thread and used to create soft, breathable and resilient textiles. So I'm seeing some questions about what is a bowl. Okay, before I move on, let me actually address what a bowl is. A bowl is a very specific word to plants. So it's like a rounded seed capsule in a plant. That's what we find cotton in. So cotton is found in bowls. Okay, B-O-L-L. -L. Bit of an interesting word there. Also the word endemic. I'm assuming a lot of people have not seen the word endemic before. Okay, so endemic. If a plant is endemic to something, that means it is native to that region, okay? So, native to tropical location, native to subtropical locations. All right, guys? Let's keep going. Let's keep doing it. Cotton has been used for fabric from prehistoric times. Wow. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Prehistoric times. Cotton has been farmed since antiquity. But it wasn't until the introduction of the cotton gin, which reduced the cost of production, that it became the most frequently used natural fiber fabric for apparel. So after this, it became the most common type. All right. So guys, what do I learn about this first text? This first text is obviously all about cotton. A thing that goes without saying, it's pretty obvious, okay, it is all about cotton. It's telling us about the qualities of cotton, where it's found, and how common it is in different clothes. Next up, wool. I'm seeing some more comments as well about what antiquity actually means. So let me go over that. It was in this text here. Let me find where it was. Since antiquity, okay. Think of the word antique, guys. The word antique, something old. Okay, so antiquity is like the ancient past. That is what antiquity is. Perfect. Let's keep going. Wool is the protective covering or fleece of sheep and other hairy mammals, including goats and camels. Utilizing sheepskins for clothing, the prehistoric man finally discovered how to create yarn 
and fabric from their fibre covering. Wool is typically acquired by shearing the fleece of living animals. However, the pelts of sheep are sometimes treated to release the fibre, resulting in pooled wool, which is of inferior quality. It is often white in colour, but may also be brown or black. So what am I learning so far here? That this is all coming from sheep and hairy animals, and there are different ways of removing it to give us different types of wool. Now, single wool fibres are resilient because they may return to their original length after limited stretching or compression, giving textiles and garments the ability to hold their shape and resist creasing. Wool fibre also has outstanding affinity for dyes, and it's quite absorbent. So, so many different features, qualities of wool that are coming up in this last paragraph. So, text A, cotton. Text B, wool. Let's keep reading, guys. Two more texts to go, and then we're going to actually answer some questions. All right, next text. Silk is a type of natural protein fibre that may be woven into textiles. Silk is mostly made of fibrin and is produced by certain insect larvae to construct cocoons. The finest silk is obtained from the cocoons of captive red larvae of the mulberry silkworm Bombyx mori. The shimmering appearance of silk is a result of the triangular prism-like structure of the silk fibre, which allows silk cloth to refract incoming light at different angles, thereby producing various colours. That's actually really cool. I didn't know that before I read this text. Cool stuff. Several insects generate silk, such as web spinners, wasps, and bees. But only the silk of moth caterpillars has been traditionally used for textile production. So only one specific type of silk is being used for clothes. All right, text C is done. Last text, guys. Let's have a look. Text D. Rayon is a synthetic textile. Synthetic. Made from regenerated and purified cellulose taken from plant sources. Rayon is a regenerated fiber because cellulose extracted from softwoods or the short fibers that adhere to cotton seeds is converted into a liquid compound squeezed through tiny holes in a device called a spinneret and then converted back to cellulose in the form of fiber. So a bit of a crazy process. The other three that we looked at so far were all natural things, right? But rayon is synthetic. So here is a very, very big difference compared to the other texts. Let's keep going. Rayon shares many characteristics with cotton and can be manipulated to mimic silk. In garments, rayon is used alone or in combination with other fibers to replace cotton in situations where cotton is typically used. High strength rayon is transformed into tire cable for use in automated Tires. Oh wow, that's really interesting. Rayon is also used when wood pulp with wood pulp in the production of paper. Wow, so the same thing that's used in clothes is also used in car tires and to produce paper. Very, very, very interesting. So guys, just to recap all the key things in each text, text A, cotton, text B, wool, text C, silk, text D, rayon. Let's jump into some questions. Number one, which extract mentions a type of fabric that is made from certain animals who originally had them as a safety coat? I want to see some brainstorming in three, two, one. Let's do it, detectives. Amazing work, guys. 
one will be B. Why is it B? Because if I go back to text B, let's actually have a look at it together. Back up to text B. Let me pick a color here. Text B, right? We said over here that they were using the protective covering from sheep and other hairy mammals. So that's it. Text B. Got some evidence. Matches that perfectly. Okay, what about question number two? Question number two. A fabric that forms a shielding case throughout the seeds of a certain plant that comprises that fabric. Who remembers which text this was mentioned? Who was paying close attention and writing down the keywords? Who was focused? Let's have a look. What do we think for this one, guys? Question number two. Question number two. I'm going to wait for some more answers. What do we think for number two? Perfect. 2A. Why is it A? Let's have a look. Back up to text A, right? So I'm looking for a shielding case. If I go up here, protective casing around the seeds of cotton plants. That's exactly what I needed. So therefore, A will be the correct answer over here. I know some people also thought D for this one. Let me explain why it's not D. OK, because it's not necessarily taken from the same protective casing. All we're told here is that it's extracted somehow. Yes, it is similar to the cotton, but it's not actually told how similar it is and how it's extracted. If I don't have the details directly written in front of me, I'm not going to assume it. And therefore, I'm going to go with option A for number two. All right. Next up, number three, a man-made fabric that is created through the use of a renewed and refined organic compound derived from plants. What do we think? A, B, C, or D for question number three. I think three is a really, really easy one. Three is going to be D because the only man-made thing, the only synthetic thing was rayon. I didn't even need to go back to the text. You guys already know this. Okay, number four. A fabric that utilizes sheets from specific insects and its finest quality comes from insects that are raised in captivity. What do we think for question number four? Question number four. What are we thinking? Question number four. I want to see a couple more answers in the comments, guys. Oh, yeah, you, you, guys, you guys are way too good today. I'm beyond impressed. Four will be C. Absolutely. If I go and check on the text, okay... We're looking at insects that are raised in captivity, okay? We are talking about the finest silk coming from these specific larvae. Very, very interesting. Only the one in the moth caterpillars was used for textile. So, perfect for C. Let's keep going. Number five. A fabric that is used independently or blended with other types of fabric as a cotton substitute when making various apparel. What do we think for number five? I want some answers for number five in the comments. Quick, 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 detectives. What are some answers for number five? Blended with others or used independently. Five is gonna have to be D. This is one of our keywords, guys. See why keywords are so useful? Back up here, if I go to the text, it said, that either it is used alone or in combination with other fibers. Exactly what we were looking for. 5D. Keep going. Number six. A fabric that recovers to its real size after pulling or squeezing, enabling it to form retention and wrinkle resistance. Who remembers which text this was mentioned in? Which type of fabric had this? Which type of fabric mentioned this quality? Which one? I want some answers for question number six. Quick, 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 quick. Question number six. Oh, I'm seeing a bit of variety for question number six, actually. Interesting. Six is the first one that seems to be causing a bit of a debate. So I want some more answers for six, and then I'll go over it. Question number six. What do we think? Six, guys, is actually going to be B. And let me explain why six is B, okay? Let's go back to text B. Back up, back up, back up to text B. 
Remember, what we were looking for in this question was something that has wrinkle retection that goes back to its original shape. Look at this. The ability to hold the shape and resist creasing. Well, creasing is wrinkles, isn't it? They're synonyms. Boom. One of my keywords, they gave me the answer. Some people are saying C as well. Let's have a look at why C doesn't work. Okay. We don't have anything here that says that C has these qualities. The only quality that's mentioned about silk is how shiny it is. The shimmering appearance. How it bends or refracts, refracts light. It doesn't mention what I was looking for in the answer option. Cannot be C. I saw some people saying D as well. Okay. Some people saying D. We're not exactly told directly whether it can crease or hold its shape. Okay. Well, that some of it can be high strength and it can be used in all these different uses. But does the text ever directly say this, this and this? No. I need to only pick the answer that is directly stated as it is in that text. That is going to be the correct option. So therefore, six, I'm going to go with option B. OK, guys, let's do one more. Who is ready for the whoops? Who is ready for the last one, best one? Last one, best one, let's do it. Last one, detectives, let's do it. Number seven, a type of fabric that is also converted into cords that can be used for automobile wheels. Question number seven. Question number seven, detectives. Keep your hats on for the last one. What do we think? I want answers in the comments. Answers in the comments, guys. Let me have a look. Let me have a look. I'll wait for a couple more people to give it a go. Question number seven. Option D. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Let's go over it. Why is it D? Well, D was the only one that was synthetic, and we were talking about automobile, automotive tires, automobile wheels, same thing. They're just synonyms. So guys, looking out for synonyms in these questions. Whoops, let me pick a different color. Looking out for synonyms in these questions can be very, very, very useful. That's exactly what we're saying in the answer, just as a synonym. And that means we are done for the day. So there are a couple more questions here that you can have a go if you want to pause the video, have a look at it, and here are the answers if you want to have a go at it. But in saying that, you already have quite a bit of homework to do. There have been some questions uploaded already for you guys to try out on evaluation. Make sure you get the English homework done before tomorrow. Because tomorrow is homework review. Which means get that work done so we can go over it tomorrow, guys. Alright? Perfect, perfect, perfect. That's it for me today. Have a lovely rest of your afternoon, detectives. Hope you all have an amazing day. Enjoy maths. Enjoy thinking skills. I will see you all back again tomorrow morning. Bye, everyone. See you later. Comment down below for me if you had fun, if today's class was lit, and I'll see you soon. Bye.